All right, good evening, everyone. I believe we are um, now uh, live uh, with TC Media and in our Zoom. So I will call the meeting to order and I will see, I believe we have everyone here. We have all the council members here, so I will dispense with roll call. Uh, so the first item on our agenda and uh, Administrator Doan was having some computer issues, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, Warren Hendrickson, uh, and he will be giving us a brief on the airport master plan update and for the original airport, and um, and he's also the state uh, commercial aviation coordinator commission. Uh, so I would like to introduce Warren. And do you have a PowerPoint presentation you're going to do, or just? Um, I, I do, and I see that I'm already authorized to share screen. So whenever we're ready, I'll I'll commence. All right. So I will go ahead and turn it over to you. So welcome. Well, thank you, Mayor Sullivan and uh, council members. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, as well as with city staff. And uh, looking forward to the opportunity, uh, especially since I'm fairly new here at the Port of Olympia. Let me go ahead and pull up my presentation. And let's verify that, in fact, everybody can, in fact, see it in presentation mode. Uh, yes, I can see it. Perfect. The first technical challenge of the evening has been met. <laughs> in any case, a, a little background on me. I have been at the Port of Olympia since um, this past July, so uh, not quite at the end of my first year. Uh, my official title is Airport Senior Manager. Uh, that makes me one uh, member of the leadership team. My predecessor, Rudy Rudolph, who has been here for almost 19 years, uh, has moved up, uh, and I'm sure probably many of you are familiar with Rudy, uh, is now the operations director for the port. So I am very fortunate uh, to have my predecessor with all that experience available to let me know where all the hidden file cabinets are so I can find out all the information. So the first part of my presentation tonight will be dealing strictly with the airport master plan update at Olympia Regional Airport. Um, and then the second part of my presentation is uh, I will switch hats and uh, speak as the acting chair of the Commercial Aviation Coordinating Committee. And, and, and uh, this uh, committee or commission uh, is, I, you, I will often refer to it as the CAC. Uh, I wound up on the, as the acting chair uh, Somewhat by accident, I'm probably all of you can probably identify with all volunteers take one step forward. And before I knew it, everybody else had taken one step back. And so I was somewhat uh, uh, surprised to find myself in that role. But my predecessor, David Fleckenstein, WASDOT Aviation Director, retired December 1st. I was serving as vice chair, so I now am fulfilling that acting chair role. My, my role on the CAC has nothing to do with my position at the Port of Olympia or at Olympia Regional Airport. I also serve with an organization called the Washington State Aviation Alliance. It's an alliance of all the aviation organizations in Washington State, except for commercial, except for military. So pilot associations, airport management associations, and the alliance purpose is, le is legislative advocacy. And, and it was chosen as one of the non-voting members on the CAC. Uh, by the legislation. So, but we can talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, let's jump right in here into the master plan update. When I complete that presentation, I'll stop. So if there's any questions or any discussion along those lines, uh, we'll complete that portion of it. And then we'll go ahead and then move into the CAC update subsequent to that piece. So with that, the uh, airport master plan update, what is it? It is a comprehensive study of an airport that usually describes the short, medium, and long-term development plans to meet future aviation demand. It is done because we are an FAA-funded airport. We're part of the National Plan for an Integrated Airport System. It's called NIPIUS by its acronym. Uh, that, that designation applies to about 3,300 airports of the 5,000 public-use airports in the country. Uh, in Washington State, there are 64 
airports of 132 that are eligible for federal funding. All of them then do a master plan update. Typically, they're done every eight to 10 years, uh, depending upon the nature of growth and the changes uh, within the aviation marketplace. The master plan was last done here at Olympia Regional Airport in 2013. So we're right at that 10 year point. And uh, it, it's time to go ahead and update our FAA documents, which then provide the guidelines for everything that we do on the airport in the next eight to 10 years. A master plan's purpose is not to solve for any airport management operations or maintenance issues. It is a long-term planning document. Our contractors are the Aviation Planning Group. Uh, it is uh, a DBE company uh, and uh, the subcontractor is Dow. Uh, they've done a fabulous job for us. Uh, we have been at this for just shy of two years now. Uh, we started the process uh, in the second quarter of uh, 2021. The funding from this uh, for this master plan update comes from the FAA. The term AIP 29 that you see on the screen refers to the airport improvement program from which all federal funds come. And this is the 29th such grant we have received here at Olympia Regional. The total cost of the master plan, 655,000 and change. And because this grant was issued in 2021, the port was lucky. Congress authorized all grants in 2021 by virtue of the pandemic to be paid at the 100% rate instead of reimbursement rate instead of 90%. So by virtue of the fact that this grant was fully paid for by FAA funding, uh, the port saved $65,000 and change uh, from what would have been its normal contribution. The goals of the master plan are the five bullets that you see here. The first one is, is to take a look at what the aviation demand is currently and forecast, and then design your airport to meet it. Um, we also have to ensure that as airport design standards are improved over time, that our airport continues to meet you know, those current airport design standards, much like in the city code, as city code changes, uh, as uh, renovations are done on homes or commercial businesses, you have to upgrade to meet the current code. It's no different for an airport. We have to upgrade to meet the current Air FAA design standards when projects are affected by those standards. We also prepare for future development with an outlook. Initially within the first 10 years is what we're targeting, but we also have a long-term outlook to 20 years to say, okay, what's the path look like beyond that 10 year period? What should we be thinking about? We also prepare for emerging avi aviation technologies. This master plan update does that uh, to a greater extent than any time in the past. I'll address that here shortly. And then we will also plan for and demonstrate airport self-sufficiency. There are six primary chapters in a master plan document. Uh, and, and these are the six bullets that you see there. The first one is inventory. And, and as, it, as it sounds like, the first thing you do is take a look at what do we have today? Uh, what is our current inventory in terms of hangars and runways and facilities, uh, based aircraft, uh, navigational aids, weather uh, equipment, maintenance facilities, flight training facilities, what do we got? And the second piece is the forecast. And this is one of two very critical components uh, associated with the master plan. A master plan document is a full-fledged report, but there are only two parts of it that are required to be approved by the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, one of which is the forecast. So in other words, you just can't say, well, this is what we think is going to happen. We have to prove it. And there are proven scientific methods and algorithms by which we can analyze current traffic and trends and historical records, uh, as well as the regional and nationwide traffic growth, and then come up with a forecast. And once we actually come up with a forecast that says, this is what we believe the outlook is over the next 10 to 20 years for Olympia Regional Airport, we first then, before we do anything else, we have to stop and we have to submit it to the FAA and await their approval. Uh, the good news is, is they, they fully approved that in uh, late 2021. Uh, that document is the one approved document that lies on the airport website at this time. Uh, the link is, by the way, is in your, uh, your uh, work session uh, meeting packet for tonight, so you can easily access that forecast. And then once you know what you have in inventory, and then once you have an FAA approved forecast, as to what the outlook looks like, then you can say, well, what do we need? What, what do we need that we don't have? And this then is chapter three, the facility requirements. What do we need to add? What do we need to improve? What needs to be renovated? 
what needs to be changed to meet airport standards that the FAA produces. And then chapter four then leads to a series of alternatives. Well, you can take no action or you could do the full Cadillac approach and do everything and then have a series of steps in between. We started with about four primary, uh, four alternatives from no action all the way up uh, to trying to do everything that it looks like the airport could ever need. And we settled down as is typical on a mid range approach to let's, we don't have to really physically expand the airport. We've got everything that we need here. The airport fence is not gonna move. What we wanna do is protect and preserve what we have. And so ultimately the preferred alternative is one of which we meet FAA standards and preserve and protect the pavement and the operational facilities that we have on the airport. This preferred alternative then turns into chapter five, the second approved document by the FAA called an airport layout plan. This is a very, very technical schematic map of the airport and all of its properties. And it is technical because it includes all of the runway protection zones, the safety zones, the noise contours, the current FAA standards, the building limit lines, the height obstruction standards, anything that you can think about in terms of meeting a code is on this single one page document. It gets to be quite a busy document as you can well imagine. This airport layout plan is the second piece of the master plan update that is approved by the FAA. Without an approved airport layout plan, you receive no federal or state grant funding for your projects. So this is a very critical component. And then lastly is chapter six is the implementation. Okay, what are you gonna do first? Now that you know what you have and it's approved by the FAA to meet the forecast approved by the FAA, then the next step is how are you gonna implement this in a capital investment plan, which is also approved by the FAA and they in turn give us the funding. On the right hand column, you can see where we are in terms of the drafts and by final draft, I mean when the contract team provides it to me. So uh, the final draft, I've received chapters one and three from the contractor. I'm in the process of reviewing them now. The contractor is finishing up uh, the drafts for four, five, and six, and I should have those within the next week to 10 days. The one chapter two that is complete is the one that's loaded up on the website, uh, airport website at this time. Now, in addition to those six chapters, uh, which are always a feature of every airport master plan update, uh, we have three additional appendices. Uh, the second one, the public involvement and public comments, again, is always a standard feature of all master plans uh, because we want to talk about how we involved the technical advisory committee at the beginning of the master plan effort, and then also all the public comment periods of which we've had six, essentially. And, uh, and then we chose to add two additional appendices, not required, but because the FAA agreed to fund our research and analysis into it, we went ahead and are including them as appendices, uh, appendices to, to the master plan. The first one is a commercial feasibility study. The part 139 references uh, the section of federal law that, that dictates airport certification for commercial airports. Right now, um, we do not have a part 139 certificate. We are not authorized or eligible to provide commercial service here. We did at one time. Um, Big Sky Airlines was the commercial last commercial airline that served Olympia Regional Airport. And they left uh, and discontinued service in the 2004, 2005 timeframe. So we have been without commercial service for about 18 years. I will admit, I probably get a call about once every week to 10 days on how a local resident can fly commercially to Walla Walla or Salem or Missoula or Portland. Uh, and of course, we don't offer that services there and we have to redirect them elsewhere. Uh, but there is interest. Uh, the Ports Vision 2050, which was a fairly lengthy uh, study undertaken with great community involvement, uh, one of the, the major recommendations coming from that community focus group was to keep our eyes open for the future uh, potential for commercial service here. And by commercial service, I am not talking on the level of a CTAC. I'm talking about regional commercial service, point to point, in-state, regionally, uh, where there might be a market. So that's what we studied in that appendix. And in the last appendix, the emergency te technologies, we then addressed uh, emerging uh, technologies in terms of electric aircraft, hydrogen propulsion, uh, 
sustainable fuels, uh, unleaded avgas, uh, which is receiving quite a bit of press attention here lately, especially at the state legislature level. And uh, we included quite a bit of information on that in terms of our future capabilities. This map here is not an airport layout plan, but it does provide a very high level overview as to a bird's eye view of the airport. The yellow trapezoids that you see there are what are called the runway protection zones. This is where we don't allow any development, preferably. We would rather not have any roads, any businesses, any pedestrian traffic whatsoever. Oftentimes, however, airports are built before or after uh, some roads are already in place or as part of that before these standards were in place. And so the end result is, is we try to protect that to the maximum extent possible. And uh, that just provides for safe operating practices uh, surrounding the neighborhood and the, the airport. Uh, the light orange areas that you see are future aeronautical development. So for general aviation, small aircraft, we have this area over here. We also have a corporate potential capability for business jets and larger aircraft. Our Part 139 commercial service area will be over here, uh, adjacent to the New Market Industrial Campus and where the WASDOT Aviation State Agency is located now. This is off of Center Street and New Market, um, just to the uh, south of Tumwater Boulevard, an additional area over here. In terms of the actual airport fence, it does not move, as I mentioned, but we, what we will do is try to achieve additional standards by changing some taxiway locations. The dark gray lines are relocated taxiways. FAA standards now require all taxiways to cross the runway at a 90 degree angle, as an example and uh, many of our taxiways do not. So this provides a safer environment. We will also then relocate certain taxiways to achieve the desired separation distance from runway. Again, enhances um, safety overall. We will rehabilitate by uh, the, our main runway and also repair and rehab our two runways. So those are the two primary pavement uh, construction projects we'll have in the next five years. The dark gray area shows future uh, aviation related industrial property that is on or adjacent to the airport. Uh, this area over here in the upper right corner of the slide is the vicinity of where the Squire Coca-Cola lease is. The dark red areas show potential hangar development. Uh, it's an area that I will bring to uh, the city's uh, com uh, community development uh, department to go ahead and take a look at how we can go ahead and do uh, some hangar extensions where pavement exists. Most of every other bit of development uh, associated on the airport is all gonna be subject to the Habitat Conservation Plan. And I know you had a, a significant presentation on that topic at your last meeting. Here is the background and the highlights of the commercial service feasibility appendix that we'll have in the master plan. Uh, the key numbers here that you can see are over on the right side is essentially there is no market for commercial service here until approximately 2035. But in 2035, then we do begin the, having the potential as Thurston County continues to grow, that we will have this opportunity here to begin at least considering the possibility of service uh, if the market uh, penetration is sufficient to allow it to be a profitable you know, exercise for the companies that that uh, wish to get involved in that. Ultimately, by 2040, we're forecasting only 280,000 total passengers. Uh, that's a little over 20,000 per month. And uh, the total number of operations would be 20,000. Uh, to give you an idea on our operational capability right now is we're at uh, 209 uh, operations a day. Is, uh, and, and by the end of the master plan forecast period, which is about the year 2040, we will only get to 240 total op, uh, 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 operations. And an operation is a takeoff or a landing. So our growth is relatively small. In fact, the population rate of growth in Thurston County will exceed the rate of growth at the airport. Here is the overall schedule. Can I ask a question about, or would you, Warren, would you prefer if we save questions for the end? I would say if you have a question, let's go ahead and tackle it as we go along. And, you know, especially if it's if it's, uh, you know, pertinent to the moment. And uh, certainly. 
Yeah, okay. Um, in, in that case, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm sort of understanding the chart under forecast. Um, so, so what you're saying is today, like we, we have for, for these types of operations for satellite service and regional service today, we, we have zero of those. But by 2035, we're expecting 15,200 more arrivals and departures for per year from the airport. That that's I, what we're I expecting. Don't know that, 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 that you, you're looking at the chart correctly. I don't know that I would characterize it as expecting. It's just that we would have the potential, you know, to to uh, serve that number of of uh, landings and takeoffs a day for commercial service. To get to that point, we're going to need uh, we the port, the airport, the the county would need uh, an operator to come in and say we wish to establish commercial service on your airport, and 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 then you know okay uh, by by virtue of the fact that we accept federal funding, we also make a series of 39 promises to the FAA for giving us that funding. Those 39 promises are called grant assurances, and they're pretty common sense. You'll, you'll be good stewards of the, of, the, uh, of the airport, of the money we give you. You'll take care of your facilities. You'll be fair. You will not discriminate. You'll be open to all. You are a public use airport. But one of those is, is that we have to be open to all users. And if a commercial operator says, we want to come and establish operations at Olympia Regional Airport, those grant assurances that we've accepted and signed off on require us to say, okay, you know, you, you are allowed to come in, but it's up to that company to do their own due diligence and make their own business case. But we cannot close the door on any user as a public use airport. So it really depends on whether or not some operator thinks that the market will materialize to what we think may happen in the next 15 to 20 years. And we don't, on, on the left, we, we don't anticipate someone doing that until at least 2030 because of things like population density down here, the demand for flights in this area, like that. I, I guess like that's that's sort of an estimation based on like we don't think the market will support a commercial user wanting to come here until at least 2030 that as opposed to all of the changes in the runways need to happen before they will do it. Right. And and that that is exactly correct. And we, we don't see any potential for any of that, not until 2030, but actually 2035. So if you look at that one column there. So we just don't think that there's enough, and you're exactly right, based upon demand, uh, market uh, penetration, uh, you know, population growth, all those factors that would go into providing a viable commercial level of service uh, won't exist. And emerging technologies is a part of that uh, because the uh, electric aviation, uh, we've already got several aircraft capable of providing um, commercial service as an electric, uh, electric uh, uh, with an electric engine. Uh, they're already flying, they're not certified or approved yet, but they're already in the test mode. So we can see that happening. And, and with electric aviation, as opposed to fuel, uh, your break-even costs are substantially lower. And so as a result, that, that could, if the emerging technology proves itself uh, and meets the standards required by the FAA, uh, we could see then where uh, a break-even case might be, might be viable. Okay. And, and in terms of like, what kinds of airplanes, you know, it sounds like technology is a factor and electric and hybrid electric airplanes are not as noisy as, as traditional fossil fuel airplanes. But I, I mean, like, if, if we were looking at 15,000 arrivals and departures, I mean, that's like 40 something a day, if that is a number that actually comes to materialize. Mm -hmm. So I... I, I guess my question is like, what type of, are we talking like commercial operators? Is, are, are we expecting like a Cessna operation or are we expecting more like a Southwest, like large carrier that flies big planes that has lots of people on it? Uh, not, not the latter. It would be more yeah. of a smaller, smaller sized, uh, personalized uh, 19 seater, 25 seaters, possibly a 75 seater twin engine jet 
uh, similar to an Embraer uh, that you see in your regional carriers, your connection carriers for the major airlines. Our runway is not capable of supporting the weight uh, of a large Southwest stock jet. Uh, another stage of my life, I was actually a commercial airline pilot for 28 years. Uh, I flew the 737 that Southwest flies, that Alaska Airlines flies. Uh, you could take a 737 and park it on the runway as long as it had no fuel, no passengers, no cargo, uh, and the runway would support it. But the minute you tried to put people or payload or baggage or fuel on it, it the runway would not support it. It's not strong enough. So even though we may have 5,500 feet of runway that might allow certain operations, the runway is not structurally strong enough to handle it. And nothing that we're doing in this master plan update is changing anything uh, with regard to runway configuration. Uh, in fact, we're actually shortening our secondary runway to return more pervious surface to the airport, uh, but we're not lengthening or extending. All we want to do is just maintain what we have. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Councilmember Kathy, did you have a question? I do. Thank you. Um, welcome, Warren. Glad that Thank you're you. here. Yeah. Um, there's been lots of questions flying around about the airport, so you, you got to be a good answerer, don't you? <laughs> um, one of the questions I have is the is the fuel. Um, now, if we go to anything that's commercial, uh, commercial planes don't use leaded fuel, correct? It depends upon the type of airplanes that are used. So if it's a jet, even the business jets that fly into here now will use a, what's called Jet A. Jet A is essentially is a kerosene. It is a fossil fuel. It is eligible for, for a biodiesel option or a biofuel option, um, but it does not contain lead. If, if the aircraft is powered by a piston engine, you're, as you typically see, your propeller-driven smaller aircraft, those aircraft require a small amount of lead in the fuel. And it really is an engine issue because without that lead, the engines would be subject to detonation and uh, and, and essentially the engines would, would not survive uh, with without that lead component. Mm -hmm. So th there is a bill right now before the state legislature to try to address this issue. Uh, my personal opinion is, is what we need to do is we need to get lead out as soon as possible there is an approved unleaded fuel available for piston engine aircraft that universally applies to every piston engine aircraft ever built or that's in existence now. The trouble is there's no production or distribution facilities yet in place. And in my mind, I would like our airport here to be the first one in the state to offer this unleaded fuel. But what we need to do is create an incentive for the manufacturers to go ahead and start the production and the di distribution chain, because we don't need to change anything on the airport. You can put that new unleaded fuel, 100 octane unleaded fuel into our existing fuel tanks, into existing airplanes. There's some paperwork and certification that goes along with it. But in terms of the technical capability, it literally is a drop in replacement for the fuel that we use today with no harm to the engines or the aircraft. Hmm. So. That, that is where we need to go. Uh, and the solution was approved by the FAA last fall. And now we just need to light a fire under the industry literally to, to get it out into the marketplace. Uh, well, thanks for that. I have one other quick question, which is um, when you do these studies and you look to the future and the increased use and whatever, um, I'm, you, do you do quite a study on uh, air pollution, on pollution issues and what a yes, yes. What an pollutes. Yes. Yeah, that 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 is part of it. It is it is part of the documentation within our master plan report. Um, even the 2013 has that addressed in there, so that will be part of it. Uh, one of the things that we will be doing, you'll see it in a slide shortly. Uh, once we have the master plan update process complete, uh, although it could be deferred to a later time frame, we think it's a good approach as a port and for the community to do a SEPA planning checklist right away. And so we will engage in that process uh, very quickly. And then that way, any projects coming down the road will already be covered you know, by this initial SEPA project uh, uh, planning checklist. We did one in 20, uh, after the 2013 master plan, 
and we will do another one again here. Thank you for that. Appreciate sure. it. Sure. Mm -hmm. One of the things too, since we talked about Jet A and, and biofuels, mm -hmm. is, is uh, two of the things that do apply is, is of course, even if we could offer biofuel here, that, that makes every airplane leaving Olympia Regional with biofuel, but that doesn't necessarily address the airplanes that are coming in from elsewhere. So right. this biofuel issue, the unleaded fuel, leaded fuel issue, this is truly a global problem, not just a one airport problem. And right. we all need to be on the same team. We also need to get the FAA involved because right now, even if biofuel was 100% available from a safety, pragmatic, conservative approach that the FAA always takes, they will only allow jets to use a maximum of 50% biofuel in their mixture. So we're still going to be at the 50% fossil fuel rate at best until we have enough of a track record and the uh, the safety record has proven itself. Mm. Oh, thanks for that. Sure. Councilmember Snyder, did you have a question? Thank you, I do, Mayor. Thank you, Warren. So the, the one question I have is you mentioned that there'd be no expansion in the next 10 years. And you also mentioned that we could have regional commercial planes here by, I believe, 2035. So does the airport have any plans to purchase more land for future expansion? No, no, we do not. If we did, it would be part of this master plan update. And, and you know, it was, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question that, that way, council member, because uh, in my recent dialogues with community groups, uh, there, there's one, one group that's called Stop Olympia Airport Growth. And, and at first, you know, as I began the dialogue and trying to understand exactly, you know, what the concerns and the considerations were, what became obvious to me was there is a difference between the term expansion and the term growth. And, 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 it, and it's nuanced, admittedly, but expansion, uh, from the way I look at it, uh, from the way the aviation marketplace looks at it, expansion is what are you doing to increase or decrease the overall size of the airport, the physical plant? Are you buying land, moving the fence, uh, taking into account additional property? Uh, we have zero plans for expansion. We have 845 acres on the airport. We've got another 700 acres of quote unquote airport land that serves our clean water center, new market industrial campus as industrial uh, uh, capability. Uh, all of that revenue has to stay by the FAA on the airport. So, so those new market and clean water center properties provide revenue to keep everything operating on the airport. Uh, but we're not expanding the airport whatsoever from that aspect. What we will see is incremental growth. And as the population of the county grows, so too will, will uh, the amount of aviators that use the airport. We are the capital city airport. And so as a result, that alone, at, as the seat of our state government, will bring people in. Uh, we see that on a regular basis. What's also interesting uh, that I, I came here not being a Thurston County resident is when I came here and I started looking around at the overall market, uh, we are the only public use airport in Thurston County with paved runways, which is a fascinating thought. There's two other public use airports, multiple private airports, but the other two uh, uh, public use airports are uh, grass runways, so for smaller operators. So if you're coming to Thurston County by air, uh, we're it. <laughs> so that that means we, and especially as the as the home of uh, Department of Natural Resources firefighting, uh, airlift Northwest medical evacuation, the Washington State Patrol for law enforcement, the governor's airplane. Uh, it's important we we maintain a, a functional airport for those facilities. Thank you, thank you for that answer. And I have one more question. On sure. one of your previous slides, you, you had a layout of the airport and where the Coca-Cola plant was going to be. Is there any, that one there? Thank you. Is there any way you can send that to us? Because I know a lot of people have inquired about where that Coca-Cola plant's going to be. And this sure. illustration really clarifies that. Sure, sure. I was in conversation with Hannah later today. What I'll do is I'll convert this presentation over and I'll send it all over to Hannah and then she can distribute it to the entire council so you'll have it available as part of your packet. And uh, yeah, if you need any more information, I'm literally only a phone call away. So whatever you need, you let me know. Or if you want to, if your constituents want to get directly in touch with me to have a conversation, happy to do that at any time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. So here's the overall time frame. We started to address that a little bit. Uh, and here's where we are. Uh, this will finish up the master plan conversations a little bit. Uh, 
I did attend a Stop Olympia Airport growth meeting in November that I learned about via social media. Um, I wasn't quite honestly invited directly to the meeting, but I thought I should go and just make myself known and be present to be a resource. Uh, during, during that meeting, the conversation came up with this, well, what public outreach has the port done on this master plan and, and the growth? And uh, we've had four technical meetings. We've had five open houses. And they said, well, why can't we just have an open question and answer session? So I was like, well, if there's if there's a request for it, then we'll make that happen. We did that on January 18th. Uh, no time limit, not public comment, just a free for all flowing discussion. We went anywhere that the community wanted to go. We had probably about 65 people total between uh, Zoom, online, and in person, and we went over two and a half hours. It was it was a great dialogue. Uh, I really appreciated the community uh, coming to it. One of the things that I learned was. Um, there was concern, and it may have also come to your attention, that this master plan update for the Olympia Regional Airport, that the port was planning on going to 630 flights a day. And we have to stop that, was, was, was the word. And at first, it was I was trying to go through all these documents for this current update, looking where did they get that number from, what led them, what led this group to this impression. And I couldn't find it, even working with the planning groups, well, come to find out, as, as I learned and I asked some more questions, it actually goes back to the planning document of 2013. And, and that 630 number isn't a plan of what's going to happen. It defines the capacity of a single runway airport. So you take any runway in the country with a runway 5,000 feet long like ours or, or so, uh, with night capability and instrument capability, its its potential is 630 flights a day. We're at 209, and we're not forecast to get to 240. So we have far more capacity than what the airport is capable of. But to give you an idea, uh, but there was great concern about that 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 we were actually making, you know, plans to move in that direction. And uh, and and the FAA approved forecast clearly shows that that's not the case. So we were able to have that dialogue. But as for comparison purposes. I was curious about, well, what would it look like if there was that much traffic? The busiest one runway airport in the country is San Diego's Lindbergh Field. Uh, it has 610 flights a day and serves 15.6 million commercial pastors. So we have zero commercial pastors. And so, so the concern was, is that would mean that Olympia Regional would have more traffic than even San Diego's Lindbergh Field would have. And th that clearly isn't the case. We don't have the commercial service. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I was able to ameliorate those concerns. Uh, growth will happen as, as a natural uh, result of, uh, of the, pa of the uh, population growth in the county. But uh, our, our forecast rate shows, again, that we're growing at a lesser rate than our population is. So that was in January. Um, this month, in fact, just yesterday, I, I met with the, uh, the consultation team. We went over the airport lay layout plan documents to finalize those for FAA approval. I'll finish up the rest of the draft documents uh, in early to mid-March. And then by the end of next month, we should be ready to submit everything to the FAA. Uh, once the FAA completes its review to say, yes, these documents looked intact and thorough, then we'll begin posting them on the website. We will have a formal, uh, the FAA formal approval process should take about two months. That will begin on or about the 1st of April, should conclude by the end of May. During the month of April, once we submit all the documents to the FAA, we will have another formal public comment period by which anybody can make a comment on, on the master plan and will include all of those comments in uh, the uh, secondary appendix. Uh, we should then uh, complete that appendix in early May. Once we get the final FAA approval in late May or early June, we'll finish the final report. And then right now we plan on providing that to the Port of Olympia Commission at its June 26th meeting. And really it's not an approval process because the only approvals are of the forecast and the airport layout plan by the FAA. This really becomes an acceptance step for the commission as opposed to an approval. But it's an important step that, yep, we see the plan, and then it ultimately gets adopted into the port's comprehensive scheme of uh, harbor improvements. And then it becomes an official long-term planning document. 
I mentioned already that we'll then go into the SEPA checklist. We will do a couple of things that will verify uh, industrial use determinations for Swire and some of other properties. This is an FAA authorization that allows you uh, to develop certain parcels that cannot or aren't sufficiently uh, close enough to the runways to be used for aeronautical development and allows then industrial use. And then we just then begin to execute and find the funds to go forward with that. So that's the overall master plan. Again, no major changes uh, really to the footprint of the airport. We'll be moving some taxiways around to meet FAA standards and maintain what we have. Uh, we will provide more efficient lighting. We'll be moving to LED lighting from incandescence. So we wanna be more energy efficient. We will shrink the size of our secondary runway, which will again, reduce the total amount of pavement on the field and, uh, and uh, increase pervious services. Uh, most of this is all going to be dependent upon the habitat conservation plan. Councilman Wadalha, did you have some, a question or something? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Warren, I appreciate you coming tonight, and I really dig this update. And kind of linking it to your comment regarding switching um, products like to LED, where is it in your plan, or could you tell me more about like um, your overall process of like greening goods and services? right? From making sure the equipment you're using doesn't have like mercury, right? Or if you're getting refrigerators or different appliances, right? That doesn't have HFCs, like those type of elements. Do you have like right. any green specifications or like greening your work? The, the, the port does entirely. Uh, we have an entire, uh, we have a sustainability teams. We have just signed uh, at last night's commission meeting, as a matter of fact, the commission approved an interagency agreement between the port and then the Squally tribe. We went together uh, for a sustainability grant and by partnering, uh, it, it made us more eligible for the grant. So the port and the Nisqually tribe are going to combine efforts in a year long study on, on what potential our vehicle fleets have for electrification uh, and moving in that general direction. Uh, the port already has some uh, electric charging stations at the farmer's market in downtown Olympia. Uh, part of our process, one of the first steps in terms of the area uh, over by New Market, where 20 years down the right of a commercial uh, sur service has, will be all electric infrastructure over there. So if we were to create uh, an electrical charging station, it would be right in the place where those parking lots will be in the future. So what we want to do is whatever we do, we want to do it once and do it right, and then have an eye to the future moving forward. Um, as we replace our existing uh, operations on the field, we go with far improved HVAC, you know, low VOC, even the carpets and the materials that we use. We recently uh, did an upgrade into uh, the Washington State Patrol's building on Tumwater Boulevard and uh, that used uh, all LED lighting and fixtures and the improvements. So every step that we have, it all includes that. It may not necessarily show up in the capital budget, but they do show up in our, our, our M&O budget in terms of um, you know, our efforts in going forward for any kind of replacements going forward. I dig it. Thanks, Warren. Warren, I have a question. <clears throat> sure. Uh, thank you, great brief. Um, I'm on the Experience Olympia and Beyond uh, Committee. So do you have any major events planned for at the airport? Our big one is our annual air show. Uh, mm -hmm. We took a, a, last year was the first year in three years that we had it. It is Father's Day weekend in June. And uh, it's where we open up the fences. It's actually, uh, we, we, we support it. The actual uh, sponsor of, of the uh, air show is the Olympic Flight Museum. And uh, they put the event on with all their volunteers and we simply provide the facility, the manpower and the safety considerations and constraints for them to operate. But that'll be a two day air show. That's probably the single biggest event that we have uh, uh, during the year. Okay, so the, mu the museum is a separate entity? Yes, it is. It's a tenant okay. on the airport. Okay, okay, okay. I just wanted to know more about if school kids were using it and um, so I'd like some more information about, I might just visit them. They're open, right? Uh, they're open on the weekend. Saturday's a great day they're, they, uh, uh, because that's when they can bring most of the public in. Okay, got it. Thank you, Warren. Sure. <clears throat> okay, well, if uh, we're ready, I can give you an update. If, if time's sufficient, let me know how much time you have available, and then I can talk about 
the commercial aviation committee work. Yeah, no, go ahead. That's great. Okay, let me see if I can. All right, did that one show up okay that way? Yes. We'll be looking at the Capitol building, I believe. Yep. Okay. All right, well, let's jump into this one. So background, a little history. You're probably very familiar with where we are, but just uh, in case anyone's not, I'll, I'll take a few moments. This has been a Herculean task, thankless, challenging. There's been a few rewards along the way, but it, this, is, this has been tough. This has been a real tough nut to crack. Um, essentially, we've been at this for almost three and a half years now. Uh, our charge as, as a commission is to identify a single preferred location for a new commercial aviation facility by this June. Uh, our membership and administrative support, we have a total of 27 members, 15 voting members, 12 non-voting members. We have internally decided everybody has an equal voice, but when it comes down to the three major votes that the commission has to take, only the 15 voting members are part of those final recommendations. WASDOT Aviation as the state agency has been tasked with the administrative support role. Initially, when the bill was passed, by the way, unanimously, both sides of the aisle, both houses in 2019, there were only three excused uh, members that did not attend the vote. But other than that, it was 100% unanimous that, that the legislature says, yes, we need to do this. Um, the timeline was extended by subsequent legislation due to the pandemic. The overall goal was not only to address commercial air passenger service, but also air cargo and general aviation. And there were three phase deadlines, uh, January and October of last year, uh, and the June 15th deadline of this year. Funding has been a stretch. Uh, we're all volunteers, everybody has a day job. And, uh, and, and as a result, the funding that the state legislature provided us uh, did not uh, allow any independent research and analysis. We had to use existing plans or get creative in terms of how to find the data. What funds were made available to the CAC were limited to public outreach and administrative purposes. But even that gets very expensive. We wanted to do a postcard campaign here last month, and we found out we didn't even have, uh, especially to Pearson Thurston counties, just to provide an update. And we found we don't we didn't have enough funding available to even do a postcard campaign to all residences in two counties. So that's been that's been that's that's been a, a little bit of a set of handcuffs on us. We also have a couple of restrictions uh, that do apply to the nature of the work of the CAC. Uh, and these are a lot of words that are taken directly from the legislation. Essentially, what it amounts to is we cannot make any recommendations that involve King County, and we cannot make any recommendations that affect Joint Base Lewis McCord. Background on where we've been. Back in 1992, there was another study called the flight plan, and they made three recommendations after studying the overall process in the market 30 plus years ago. Uh, their first recommendation was to build a third runway at SeaTac Airport. That's been done. It was done. It's implemented and in operation. The second recommendation was to initiate commercial service at Payne Field. That's also been done. They have an authority to operate 24 commercial flights a day. And the third recommendation was to construct a new airport in South Puget Sound. And because the forecast and the observers and the studiers and researchers of the day said that this is where the population is growing and we should provide that infrastructure. And here we are 30 years later, and we're still asking ourselves the same question, how do we address the capacity need? And then the question comes up then, well, what is that capacity need? Uh, the FAA clearly saw that SeaTac was pushing the boundaries in terms of how much more traffic it could accept both from the aviation side, the airspace side, as well as from the highways and the grounds and the terminals. So it asked the Puget Sound Regional Council to study and create a forecast. It was called the Regional Aviation Baseline Study. The FAA paid for it. It was completed two years ago. And ultimately, the forecast gap, as you can see from the right-hand side of the screen, is, is that SeaTac will be 27 million commercial passengers short of providing for the demand in the Puget Sound region. It will also be 800,000 metric tons short. And all of that totals up to, if we cannot provide for that capacity, there will be a lost economic opportunity of $31 billion and 209,000 jobs. 
So to give you an idea on what is 27 million and 800,000 tons cargo compared to today, it's essentially doubling what we have today. That is essentially what SeaTac and Boeing Field and Painfield comprise today in the commercial service markets. And I, like probably many people, were skeptical that are we saying that by 2050, we're going to double the amount of aviation demand? And uh, the answer clearly was yes from the Puget Sound Regional Council. But then you go back 25 or 30 years ago and you look at the forecast that Puget Sound Regional Council made then for today, and they are spot on. Uh, so this organization knows how to do forecasts. And they've established a, a, a length of credibility, which is really helpful. On top of that, Washington State Aviation hired a consultant to also look at the capacity. They came and looked at the Puget Sound Regional Council's numbers and verified them and actually augmented them and said, yeah, they are spot on. In fact, we can tweak them a little bit, even given the pandemic, but what they did is correct. So we have now two different voices that saying, yes, this is the, this is the, these are the correct numbers for demand. And so you can see the dip that we took there in demand. The part of the orange shows that once we have demand exceeding capacity, and if you come over here to about where we are, uh, right about 2032 is where we cross the line. At 2032, pain field, even if it does everything that's on its books for improvements and growth, and SeaTac does the same thing, uh, we're out of room in 2032. And after that point, demand will exceed supply. One of the things that the CAC did as we all got together that first year or so is we took a look at all the airports in Puget Sound, tried to figure out where things were. And the first question we asked ourselves is, while well, we see this capacity, let's use the existing airports in Puget Sound and throughout the state to go ahead and meet that capacity. And what we found in that first year is, with regard to that first bullet question, can we meet it with existing airports? And the answer was no, which surprised us. But as we got into the heads down technical research and engineering data, each airport in Puget Sound, whether it be Olympia Regional or Bremerton or Shelton or Lewis County or Arlington, uh, could provide maybe four to six million passengers total of the capacity. So you would need four or five or six airports to provide the capacity needs in 2050. And the marketplace, the industry said, there's no way we can split our resources that thin over that many airports in such a small area. Uh, I would ask you to think about the, the San Francisco, Oakland Bay area. Uh, they have three commercial airports there. There's San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose. And they operate in kind of a triangle. And, and the thought is, is that a South Sound airport, again, similar to the data that was recommended in 1992, uh, SeaTac and Painfield at the north would provide three airports that would serve a similar uh, population demographic. And so we thought that, OK, uh, it looks like existing airports won't work. On top of that, we started reaching out to the airports that we were studying. There were 18 airports in the initial first round. Moses Lake on the east side of the Cascades, 17 airports in Puget Sound region. Uh, and we started reaching out to the sponsors. And that's where uh, the owners of the airport, Port of Olympia being one of them, Thurston County Board of Commissioner, County Commissioners, Lewis County, Pierce County, they all said, we're not interested in being a sponsor, you know, for any kind of growth or even a portion of the market at this at our airport. And so we realized, oh, so we have an issue not only with where, uh, but but who is willing to as as a government entity, as an airport owner, willing to help meet the capacity. And we found uh, that very few were. So here we are, knowing that we really need some kind of a greenfield site. And by greenfield site, I want to be careful to, to uh, kind of define it. It doesn't mean an area that's undeveloped, because there are no undeveloped areas anymore. Uh, there's, there's homes, there's businesses, residential communities, rural communities. There's always going to be a level of development. A greenfield site, as far as the CAC is concerned, is just a location where an airport does not currently exist. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be some impact on residents and businesses and rural communities. 
So, but the CAC clearly came to the conclusion that that's what we need. But again, coming back to the state legislature creation of the CAC, we weren't provided any funding to do that analysis. And this is where I have to give great credit to WASDOT Aviation as a state agency. Every five to seven years, they do a statewide aviation plan. Uh, we have two members of the agency are on the CAC. Uh, they knew that there was a need for much more data and research. Uh, and they realized that, well, if we do another aviation system plan update and the FAA pays for it, we can generate the data that the CAC needs for its deliberations. And that's exactly what happened. So Rob Hodgman, as one individual, is the senior aviation planner, and it was his concept, and he ran with it and made it happen. And as, as a commission, we are deeply thankful to the agency for doing that because it wasn't CAC-created data. It was created by the aviation system plan that then was fed to us for review and consideration. So a separate but parallel effort, but it certainly did help uh, provide some information. So as a result, when we went from phase one and looking at six airports throughout Puget Sound, came to the conclusion that these six airports won't, won't work. Sponsors are not willing to accept that. Our phase two recommendation this past October was to, okay, we know SeaTac is gonna hit the limits for capacity, but Painfield has room to grow. So part one of the recommendation was keep growing Painfield to its maximum extent and serve the Northern portion of Puget Sound. The second one is we have to find a greenfield site option with a two runway configuration. And that two runway configuration requires 3,100 acres. And, and we chose Pierce County Central East and Thurston County Central as the three greenfield sites. Where did those greenfield sites come from? Again, it wasn't the CAC that did it, it was the aviation system plan. They actually studied 10 greenfield sites in six counties from Skagit County on the north down to Lewis County on the south. And of those 10 sites, some of them were closely located already in Snohomish County and Skagit County where Painfield already was. One was in King County. Well, the aviation system plan could look at King County because they didn't have the legislation that pre prevented it, but the CAC can't. So people say, well, how come the Enumclaw Plateau wound up as one of the Greenfield sites? That wasn't the CAC's work. That was the work of the aviation system plan. So they could do that. And ultimately, what it came down to was these three greenfield sites provided the greatest level of capacity to meet the 2050 target. Uh, and, and that's where the commission said, we don't know everything we need to know. We know a little bit about wetlands and floodplains and the number of parcels in the airspace and the terrain. Uh, but there's a whole lot more we don't know. All the environmental factors, the infrastructure factors, but let's let's pick these three to start with. And initially, the Thurston County site in particular was one that the CAC was well aware. It directly overlies JBLM, the southwest portion of JBLM. And the law says we cannot place a facility on or near JBLM that would affect its mission. So we knew as a CAC that we couldn't do it, but we wanted to study it and, and not to make a commitment to it, but just to study it to find out, let's, let's, let's learn what we don't know. Uh, let's find out what we don't know and see if we can analyze it. So that's where those greenfield sites came from. They were six mile circles, but really the target was a 3,100 acre site somewhere within those six mile circles that might provide a facility. So what happened? Once we put, and it's no surprise, I'm sure, to any of you as council members or members of the staff, uh, once we put circles on the ground, clearly the attention of the world came to be, wow, this organization is serious. They are really looking at where they're going to put this thing, and they're going to put it right on my neighborhood. My own daughter lives in Graham and, uh, and not too far from one of the circles. And so, you know, I mean, that hit home, you know, at my house, too like many others, but the end result was is over these last three to four months now, what we have learned is that not a single local government entity at any level, whether it be city, county, or port, nor any sovereign tribal nation, all four of them, the Caliphs, the Squaxin Island, the Nisqually, the Puyallup, those tribal nations and all the local governments in Pearson Thurston County universally oppose these three greenfield sites. On top of that, universally widespread public opposition, universally. And the public says, no, not here. And 
Obviously, there's great transportation infrastructure limitations. When Representative Jake Five from Tacoma went to a town hall meeting at Graham Kapowson High School on January 13th, he, he told the group that the state does not have the money to provide the infrastructure to any of these greenfield sites. We cannot afford to build there. Uh, and then you take a look at the environmental concerns. I had the pleasure of meeting with the Nisqually Tribal Council in early December, uh, learned a lot about their history. Uh, these greenfield sites sit on top of the Nisqually River watershed. The Thurston County site is on top of the aquifer. You've got untold uh, wetlands and wildlife issues throughout these areas. Clear, clearly, it's, it's, it's a road too far. On the other side of the coin, though, we have received one piece of feedback. We have had one city that stood up and said, we'll take it. Uh, although it won't be in Puget Sound, the city of Yakima has formally requested that we consider, that we, the CAC, consider McAllister Field as the single preferred location. They actually surveyed the entire city and all the industries, uh, and they had about, um, about a 75% participation rate and about 80, a little over 80% was in favor. Of, of turning uh, Yakima Air Terminal into a, a larger commercial facility. Here's the challenge, and I met with the city manager, Bob Harrison, in January at the, at the state legislature. Uh, the, the population resides in Puget Sound, and Yakima, of course, is on the east side of the mountains. And when you do the numbers, we have to figure out how to get 55,000 people a day to Yakima. And right now, we don't have the means by which we can do that. So. Uh, but it's great that one city has said, if we can figure out the logistics and the infrastructure, uh, we can do it. So, so that's one positive piece of news uh, that certainly the CAC will consider at its next meeting. Three consistent responses from the public. Uh, we have to do whatever we do in an environmental sustainable way. So uh, council member, uh, in, in terms of your you know, building green, you know, clearly this cannot be a CTEC 2.0. In fact, the four guiding principles that the CAC operates under is one is public benefit, two is uh, economic uh, feasibility, three is social justice, and four is environmental sustainability. And, and I, I will say that it's the right people at the table. Everybody is mindful of the importance, and they're not ranked in any particular order, but they're all critical to whatever we decide in the future if, if this isn't to be made. The CAC has no means by which to decide or to execute any decision we're just a planning group. We hand a report to the legislature. Whether anything happens to it or not um, is up to the legislature to determine. The public outreach challenge is fascinating. In over three years, we have a website hosted by WASDOT Aviation. We have over 700 people that have signed up in, uh, in a little over three years. Within three weeks of placing those three greenfield sites on the ground, a Facebook group started that had over 4,200 people in three weeks. So clearly we have, a, it's, a, it's a different paradigm. Uh, our means by which people receive their information, their news, they stay up to date, isn't through the standard channels anymore, even from the source, it's via social media. And that has proven to be a big challenge in terms of how do we ensure what information is out there is in fact fact-based by which we can make good judgments. And uh, that's that's been a, a tough, tough road to navigate. So where are we today? What are the next steps? Uh, from my aspect, I'm, I'm a non-voting member. I don't have a final say in the final vote and the outcome, but my recommendation of all the voting members and the members of the CAC that I've talked to in one on conversations is we have to acknowledge the obvious, that we have been charged with the state to make a recommendation for a single site Yet we don't have any government or any public support for any of the sites that have risen uh, to the attention of the CAC. And therefore, we have to acknowledge that. Uh, we probably need to grow CAC, the uh, Painfield site to as much as we can. But beyond that, uh, our recommendation is beyond Painfield legislature, we cannot, cannot provide you a definitive site that would meet the capacity needs as of right now. And, and that's just the reality uh, of, of the circumstances. And I, and I think the legislature clearly expects that. The second piece is you may be aware that House Bill 1791 is currently in consideration. There's no Senate companion to it, but it will create a successor commercial aviation coordinating work group. Uh, it's now under active consideration. On Thursday, it passed out of the committee, uh, House Transportation Committee with a due pass. Um, 
And so that's moving its way through. But even though it's under consideration and the idea is to stop the CACs work and replace it, right now as a CAC and as the chair, I have a state law that I have to comply with. And the state law says you will do your work and you will make this recommendation. And until I receive an enacted legislation that says otherwise, we have to continue to do what we have been charted to do. But I think we can still acknowledge in that recommendation what we have learned over, especially these last four months. We will continue our community engagement. Uh, next week, we will host two open houses uh, with one hour long Q&A sessions, open-ended. Uh, I will be providing a short PowerPoint presentation as to much of the information I'm presenting here, but much shorter, uh, so that we can get as many Q&A, uh, uh, as much Q&A time as we can uh, within that, within that uh, one hour block of time. And then we will prepare for our next meeting tentatively set for March 30th. Uh, it is not beyond the realms of possibilities that the CAC may look and read the tea leaves and make a final decision at this next meeting. Uh, there's nothing that says we have to go to June 15th, especially in light of the legislation, but I think we have to be pra pragmatic and, and recognize uh, the lack of government support uh, and public support for anything in South Puget Sound and okay, now we have to step back and try to figure out what the next steps are. And that working group will have uh, an important role to play uh, without necessarily the deliverables and the time constraints uh, that the CAC has had. And what that means is uh, ultimately we'll submit this final recommendation to the legislature. But mostly I think, and what I'd like to share with you and what I would like you to share with your constituents, with the other people in business and the community, uh, with the state legislators that you, you come into contact with, is, is how do we redirect the conversation? What's important? And I'm gonna leave you with four questions. These are the next steps for all of us going forward. Because we've heard the answer, no, not here. But the first question we really need to step back and ask is, do we agree that we have a problem? Is this forecast aviation capacity deficit, both passenger and cargo, um, is that a problem? And if we can't agree that it's a problem, then we're done. We, we stop. If, if we agree there's a problem, then the second question is, do we agree it's worth solving? And that's an important question because we might say, yeah, there's a problem, but we don't see a path forward and it's, it's just not worth solving. And and if we get to that point and we all agree that that is the approach, then, then again, we're done. But if we agree that there's a problem and we agree it's worth solving, then if so, how? And what the CAC has been charged with is where, not so much the how. And we really need to ask both questions. How do we solve this capacity? How do we leverage new technologies? How do we leverage rail? Uh, as an example for rail, I got curious, can high-speed rail bring people to Yakima? One of the largest high-speed rail systems in the country is the Isila train run by Amtrak in the northeastern U.S., probably the most densely populated portion of the country. It runs from Boston to New York to Washington, D.C. In the three years <clears throat> preceding the pandemic, its, its average capacity was 9,500 passengers per day. And we're talking about a system that if we go to Eastern Washington would have to provide 55,000. So here we have a mature high-speed rail that that uh, only provides about one sixth of the capacity we would need. So does, does it have a place to play? Undoubtedly, I'm not sure how it fits in. But in any case, these are all the considerations we have to take into account where, how, and then lastly, if we decide, you know, this isn't, this is a bridge too far, it's not worth solving, we don't know how to solve it, then we have to realize that we may have to be willing to accept the consequences of taking no action. Recognizing that the $31 billion of economic impact does not come, the jobs do not come, uh, and that when demand exceeds supply at SeaTac and Payne Fields, uh, uh, prices will go up, uh, nonstop markets will decrease, larger airplanes will be in there, there'll be more connective travel, uh, businesses may be able to provide the higher ticket prices, but families that want to go on vacation to the East Coast may have to drive to Portland or to Spokane or Tri-Cities to, to get out of town. Uh, uh, there's a lot of consequences if once, once demand exceeds supply, uh, and we just have to be aware that that's the consequence of no action. 
So, but if we can frame, I think the future conversation around these questions, then we begin a dialogue on, okay, do we have a problem and what do we do with it? And 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 maybe we change the direction as as opposed to putting a particular circle on the ground. Just just my thoughts of what I've learned over the last you know several years in this project. So that's where we are. I hope that's helpful in some way. So thank you very much. Do we have any questions? I am not seeing any. So I, oh, count, uh, council member four up. I just want to say thank you for this very in-depth report. I, it's very well presented and I appreciate um, all that you have been through as far as the committee goes. And, uh, um, but again, I just appreciate this update. Uh, it's very, very informative. So thank you for doing that. Um, and then as I was curious then how the, I think you already explained it, but how that uh, 1791, you're still, will still present your report. 1791 will be a separate, how does that interface with the work that you've already done? Well, they'll, they'll probably leverage the, the work that we've done. I mean, certainly we're an open book. Everything is a matter of public record. So we'll share everything uh, uh, that we have with them to benefit whatever, whatever studies and research they need to undertake. Uh, the legislature is going to provide this working group some additional funding for research and study and analysis, which will be helpful. Uh, the fiscal note to the bill shows that uh, where we got zero, they're saying that this effort could take up to 1.9 to 2 million. I think it was 1.93 million was, you know, potential funding that might be required. I think there was 257,000 applied uh, in this first year but with a target for down the road. So if you provide the right funding and you get the right analysis, you can do the in-depth environmental work, infrastructure work as necessary, but it's still gonna be, how do we cite this in a location that is publicly and uh, publicly acceptable? Councilman Schneider, did you have a question? I did, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Warren, for a great presentation and certainly an eye opener, I appreciate that. So my question is, you, you mentioned if there'll be, there'll be some public meetings, I believe you mentioned on March 8th and 9th. Yes. Is there a, a time and a location for that? Uh, yes, uh, well, it'll all be virtual, be 100% virtual. We have Zoom meeting links. Uh, the WASD Aviation website uh, is, uh, if, if you just, in fact, if you just do a web search for Commercial Aviation Coordinating Commission, it'll be the first item that comes up. Um, you know, on, on your hit list and uh, click on that. It takes you right to the WASDOT Aviation website and the meetings will be posted there. Uh, we've also issued some press releases on it. Uh, I can directly make sure that you have available. The, uh, the March 8th session is a midday session uh, around the lunch hour. The March 9th one is late afternoon, five o'clock or so, so we can catch people at the end of the workday. But I can make sure I'll, I'll pass that along to the city clerk and they can distribute that to the entire council. I just want to add to Warren, Charlie, in our packet, I just looked at it in the attachments on the very, very bottom. There's a link that Warren just talked about. Oh, yeah, and you that's click right. on that. That's right. Yeah. So yep. it's another. I... Okay. I appreciate that. I did see that. So thank you for that, Lieta. And, mm -hmm. and thank you, Warren. Thank you again. I, I will offer to, if there's ever, uh, I'm, I'm a big one on dialogue. That's just my own personal thought. Regardless of what it has to do with the airport, the, the relationship to the community, uh, I've had the great good fortune. I've spoken to the Lacey Chamber. Um, I'm going to be speaking to the Olympic Kiwanis next month. Uh, uh, Thurston Regional Planning Council. I spoke to the MLS Association of of, uh, of Tom Water last week and Thurston County. And so, if there's an opportunity to have a dialogue, or if there's any questions, please know I am only a phone call away, and I'm happy to provide whatever resources uh, your constituents may request or any information they would like to know. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think this has very been very informative and uh, and helps us answer questions also. So. Very good. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Yeah. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, City Administrator Doan, did you have something? I see you came in with uh, your mic off, so that's why I was. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm just uh, prepping for the next item. Okay. Perfect. All right, if there's no other questions, I want to thank uh, Warren 
for attending this evening and it's been very helpful. And then we will move on to our next agenda item, which is Experience Olympia Beyond Update and Austin Ramirez will be presenting this. Or you, starting it. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna in turn though introduce Annette Pitts to council and let her lead the discussion if that's okay. She has uh, some findings from the recent survey and then also um, their 2023 strategy to present. So Annette, I'll I'll let you take it from here. Great, hi guys, thanks Austin. So um so many familiar faces I'm happy to see and a few that are new. So thanks for letting me be here, everyone. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And I think kind of something just off the top. Um, let's see here, is this going to allow me to, there we go. Um, I think I have 45 minutes in total. I just wanted to confirm timing, including Q&A, is that correct? Uh, yes, John, okay. that's correct. Okay, great. Uh, so because I'm going to be sharing a bunch of research, guys, I really think it would be horrible for you to hold your questions to the end because you literally might be asleep. Um, I'm going to be showing you a lot of information that I think is really exciting um, about some research that we've recently um, brought together and is the basis of our business and marketing plan. But uh, I, I don't want you to wait if something kind of piques your interest. So um, to give you a little bit of information about the research that I'm talking about, you know, one of the great things that happened last year um, in our program is that we were finally able to, as part of our rebounding from the experience with COVID, uh, we were able to kind of get staffed back up, you know, during the earliest throes of COVID, we were down to two people. And right now we're at five, which, um, we really are still very short staffed, but we we're at a place that we feel sustainable right now. And one of the folks that we brought on um, is actually a market research analyst, and that's really added a lot to our program. Um, I like to talk about, you know, our work as your visitor bureau, you know, we're kind of your marketing arm and your sales arm for promoting our area as a destination. And, you know, if you're a uh, if you're an accountant, you have to follow generally accepted accounting principles. If you're an attorney, you better pass the bar. Marketing can be a little different. Um, you know, there isn't that overarching uh, set of rules. So we we work really closely with our affiliations in the industry and in destination marketing and sales. So we are accredited through destination analysts, and we've vetted a lot of this work um, through that program. So um, just wanted to give you a little backstory about that. Um, and, you know, why I think it's really important that we have this conversation today and share this information is because, you know, I've been in this position a year and a half. It'll be two years, the beginning of June. Time is flying. And one of the things that I learned early on is that I think probably in part due to COVID, maybe in part due to other things that there wasn't, I didn't get the sense that there was enough alignment between our organization and our community partners, such as our various city councils. Um, so, and, and that's really important because if we are not aligned, we're not working in lockstep um, and we're not rowing in the same direction and we have to be rowing in the same direction. Um, you know, the, the presenter that was here previous to me, it's a great example. You know, there's, here is an enormous project with enormous impact, but is there community alignment? And you see what happens when there isn't community alignment. So we know that the only way that we can get that is that we establish a deeper sense of trust with our community partners, such as you. Um, and we have to be transparent and we need to share everything we got, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so, uh, I see when we develop research programs like this and making those available to you, that's just a part of cultivating that relationship. Um, and then one more thing before we get into the actual research findings is, you know, I have this conversation a lot with folks about, you know, tourism and is it economic development, is it not? And 
you know, the easiest way I can illustrate it is if we look back to 2020, um, you know, during that earlier phase of COVID when, you know, the effectively the tourism and hospitality industry was shot down, um, <laughs> shot down, shut down and shot down. Um, you know, it was a great example of you don't know what you have until it's gone. And, um, you know, Thurston County alone in less than one year in 2020 lost over 700 jobs in this industry. And to kind of give you a little bit of scale, you might go, ah, 700 jobs isn't that much. That's the equivalent, and it was over 700. That's the equivalent of, of if both SPSCC and St. Martin's just said no mas, all those jobs gone. I think it would be a big story, right? Um, so that was the equivalent of what happened here um, for, you know, for a period of time in 2020. Um, and in that same time period, you can see on the slide what the change in revenue was from that one year. And we're still not back. You know, we're, we're progressing, but we're not back to pre-COVID numbers. So imagine, you know, if we're looking at what happened during this period of loss, if we looked at it through a lens of if we were investing um, and feeding this program like we are any other economic development program. So tourism and hospitality is really a big piece of the economic development pie in Thurston County and certainly Tumwater. Um, and in as much as tourism itself really matters to our local economy, our perceptions and our sentiment about tourism really make a difference. Um, our perceptions and ideas that we have about our area as a destination 100% color our attitude, right? Um, that attitude carries forward through our personality, it shapes our behavior, and that behavior is what our visitors experience and encounter when they're here. Um, it's the personality of our destination that our residents and our stakeholders are gonna be um, encountering and doing business with, so to speak, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we thought it was really important to take a broader view uh, and a deeper look at sentiment than what we have in the past. I know um, our program historically, you know, did a lot of work around kind of polling our stakeholders. So people like you, maybe um, downtown alliances, uh, chambers of commerce, economic development organizations. Um, last year, we, we did a really deep dive on polling our um, prospective visitors about their sentiment. But this year we added in a totally new layer um, and bless Melissa in our office, our market researcher. Um, she, she really is an expert on conducting really um, information rich, uh, high yield studies. And so we asked our local residents and our stakeholders and prospective visitors the same questions. We wanted to understand what do people think about this area? What do they think the visitor experience would be when you come here? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that's really important, but the, the findings were not at all what we thought they were gonna be. And that was kind of why I thought, you know, I think it's gonna be really important that we share this with you guys because it is the basis for our uh, business and marketing plan. But I think, especially for certain folks here, um, I think it's important for you to know that there, there are differences <laughs> between what we think and what the people coming to our area think. So uh, I'm gonna get into a whole bunch of graphs uh, and visuals that I hope as you have questions, you will just throw them out there. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is our sampling. Um, we, you know, historically we've had some pretty small samples to work with. We really put a lot of effort into making sure that this was a representative and um, meaningful sample. So um, the total sample was over 400. So we felt pretty good about that. Um, on the left here, you'll see exactly who the residents were that we're talking about. We understand that our stakeholders are often going to be residents as well. But because a stakeholder is somebody that we are doing business with, um, they might be a municipality, they might be a nonprofit, they might be an educational institution. We know that their perception might be a little different than Joe Q public living down the street. So on the left, you'll see um, kind of who the folks were that responded to our resident survey. 
um, our top three areas um, where they are employed in our area is um, number one, professional services, followed by government and nonprofit. Probably not real surprising. Um, when we look at our stakeholders over on the right, the bulk were employed between attractions and experiences, things that a visitor might engage with, um, nonprofits and economic development. We asked our residents, first of all, do you even know who our program is? I mean, we're mainly asking about the destination experience, but we want to know as the uh, Visitor and Convention Bureau for Thurston County, it's kind of important that folks have an idea of what we do because we want them to know how to leverage our information as well. We were happy and surprised that we had over 72% of locals actually um, have heard of us and know what we do. Now, I also look through the lens of, you know, as a previous student in my life, if I got a 72% on something, I would not be happy. Um, I would say that is at best C-level work, and that is not what I aspire to. So we want to go back next year and look at a lot of these responses, um, and we're going to track our performance again and hope to see some increases. I would love for this to be, and a lot of our responses, to be at the 90th percentile, not the 70th percentile. Um, we asked our visitors, um, you know, are, or, or prospective visitors, you know, are you familiar with our destination at all? And basically what we did is we did not pull people that we have communicated with before. We didn't just say, um, we didn't limit it to people who've opted into email communications, for example. We did ask them, but we also just chose random markets, um, that we, through our location services that we have in-house that we know should be feeder markets for us, we just put information out um, into these areas in California, Oregon, Colorado, you name it, and just said, you know, do you know us? Are you familiar in what level? Um, and we were, we were pleasantly surprised by the level of familiarity for these uncontacted markets. However, again, not where we want to be, so we have a bar that we're going to be working toward moving forward. Um, moving more into the kind of marketing side of things, um, I don't know if my Zoom window is blocking you as well as it is me, um, but I'm going to try and move it a little bit. Um, we asked all of our groups, you know, what is one word that you would use to describe our destination? Um, you know, we were very happy that there was some commonality that people, whether you're somebody who lives or works here or visiting the area, that you find our area really beautiful. Um, our stakeholders like the natural beauty. They like how eclectic it, eclectic it is. Our residents, um, again, eclectic, outdoorsy, diverse, green. Um, we did not anticipate that one of our top descriptors would be interesting <laughs> from our visitors, but um, we'll take that with a grain of salt. Um, but what we're looking for is, is common threads. Uh, folks that are working in the marketing realm understand that where you really kind of uh, butter your bread is where you have differentiation. And so asking folks, you know, what is that, what is that thing here that you can't find anywhere else? And that's something that we should really be hanging our hat on. And we were very surprised um, that the capital came up across the board um, as the number one response. Um, Certainly, you know, uh, having, you know, a cool downtown area, having access to the water, um, Puget Sound, natural beauty, really important. Um, but this was the common thread that folks said can only be found here. When we asked a similar but slightly different question about what our greatest asset is that we should tell people about, we did get some differentiation. Um, it wasn't just the capital. And as you'll see, the capital isn't on here. Um, uh, our stakeholders said waterfront access and just our community was number one. Uh, our residents are all about the natural beauty and parks, access to the water. Um, but I was really pleasantly surprised uh, by our visitors that, yes, said, you know, it's beautiful. It's a great capital city. But they said how friendly we were. Um, I think when you're in a, a, a city council, I could be wrong, but I think sometimes you may not always have folks coming and giving you positive news <laughs> and saying, here's something you're doing really well. And I was, 
I was really pleased by this to hear um, from our visitors that we had this kind of um, as one of our greatest assets because we can market that. Um, this was an interesting slide for us. We asked folks, you know, um, have you visited here before? And over 60, or excuse me, over 86% said they had. And this really goes hand in hand with consumer research in the industry right now that says, you know, the number one reason that people are traveling today um, domestically is to visit friends and family. The number two reason is to go places that they've been before that they haven't been able to get back to for a while. Obviously with shutdown um, relating to COVID, people are feeling not only just this desire to get out and, and explore, but they miss people. They miss their friends and family and they miss destinations that they've been to before. So um, this is actually a small but meaningful slide and it's going to speak to a lot of the work that we'll be doing this year in our business plan. Um, we asked folks, um, if you came here before, why, you know, what are, what brought you here? And they could select as many as they wanted. And I thought this one was interesting because, uh, a number one is visiting friends and family. Um, behind that is a weekend getaway behind that is a vacation getaway. You know, we often hear people say, oh, you know, people, People come here, but they're just passing through. We're just a stopover. And, and we can be a stopover and we can be a pass through um, that we try to bank on because of that proximity for, you know, as you can see at the bottom of this graph, um, you know, folks who are getting ready to go to the Mount Rainier or Olympic Peninsula or to the beach or Seattle, Tacoma. Um, but that's just, that's just a portion. So we, because so many folks are coming to see friends and family, we understand now that we have to be working with our residents and we have to be working with our stakeholders so that we are all working together in alignment about how we are representing our destination when we have friends and family and guests come visit us. We need to make sure that we are making all of our um, access to information about events and activities and attractions available to our residents and stakeholders. And I know that probably seems like common sense, but in the work of visitor bureaus where you're being funded by mechanisms like lodging tax and tourism promotion area assessments, um, you know, we're required to spend those funds 100% outside of the area, bringing people 50 plus miles away. So because we can't use those funds in that way, we have organizationally made a decision in our business plan for this year, we have to raise a lot more private funds um, because we need to spend those dollars locally educating and engaging our local residents and stakeholders. Um, I think there was a sense that um, we have a lot more day tripping than we do overnight visitation. Um, we do have a lot of according to respondents in here, that folks that came were day visitors, but we had a lot more people that were multi-day visitors. And this really aligns well with our um, location services data that we have. I believe in 2022, the average stay within the county was 3.6 days. So um, not, not too far off the mark. Um, over 60, or excuse me, 60% of folks said that when they came, they were staying at a hotel or motel. Um, you know, we do track short-term rentals through a service that we have in-house called AirDNA. Um, right now, our short-term rental um, lodging inventory makes up 11% of our total rooms. So whether it's Airbnb or VRBO, it did grow um, by 3% from since last January when it was 8%. Um, it'll be interesting to see the impact of session being back in and what it does. Um, I believe we have a really healthy balance in Thurston County of you know hotels and motels versus short-term rentals, um, but we do watch it really closely because I've in previous roles worked in community, communities where there was not a healthy balance. <laughs> and that really caused quality of life and quality of uh, place issues for um, for the people living, working, and visiting there. So here's where things start to really get interesting. Um, on this slide, you're going to see, and on the following slides, you're going to see the differential of um, 
between what our visitors versus our locals versus our stakeholders feel about our destination on some really specific areas. So Burgundy is um, people who live here. Stakeholders is people who we're engaging with, you know, businesses, organizations, um, municipalities. And then in gray, we have our visitors. So um, what you'll just at a glance see first is that we really, um, when we look at, you know, how welcome we think people felt when they came here, did our visitors feel safe when they visited? Um, do we think they were treated with respect and dignity? Do we think they had positive experiences with locals? Do we think they had fun? And do, do we think that they had an easy time navigating the destination? Overall, our locals had a little bit of low self-esteem about our, des our destination. Um, you know, we had a sense um, when it came to feeling welcome and feeling safe and being treated with dignity. Um, all of these, um, with the exception of navigation, our locals scored really a lot lower um, than our stakeholders and our visitors, but our visitors really felt much more positive most of the time. Um, there were a couple instances where our stakeholders thought it, we would do better than what our visitors said, um, but it was quite illuminating to us, um, especially on the issue of, or the perceptions around safety. Um, you know, 45% of residents thought our visitors would feel safe here. That's very low. Um, and we were pleasantly surprised that nearly 85% of our visitors felt very safe while they were here. So um, this, you know, it's, it's kind of a good news, bad news story. Um, I want our locals to feel good about where they're living and working. And we want them to share that sentiment with our visitors. Um, we are under no illusions though, that it's the same experience for people who live and work here than it is for visitors. You know, our visitors come from very different destinations. So their perspective is going to be different. But I think it's important for our municipal partners to kind of see the variation around these answers. Um, on some really key issues that we hear a lot about, um, such as the experience of encountering homelessness or panhandling, um, issues around locating public parking or public transit, our, um, you know, our locals definitely had a, a perception that, it, that visitors would have a much more negative experience. Um, locals thought that 86.6% would say they had issues around homelessness or panhandling, and it was actually only 50% of visitors that indicated that they did. Um, public parking, um, we were shocked because we hear a lot of, <laughs> we hear a lot of feedback around parking um, from our peers, and only just over 17% of our visitors said they felt that it was an issue. Uh, and just barely, uh, not even 5% said that they had issue with public transportation. So interesting facts. Um, this slide and the next uh, following behind it are gonna show you kind of what do these audiences value? Um, so th uh, this slide pertains to residents. We ask them to rate how much they agree with the items below. And the top three are kind of where we'll hang our hat for now. Um, our respondents that were residents said that tourism helps local small businesses over 92.8%. So we were really surprised by this in a, in a good way. Um, our local residents really like our festivals and events um, and they believe that they bring visitors to Thurston County. And our locals also believe that homelessness really negatively affects tourism. Um, we, again, we asked the same questions to our stakeholders, and then we ranked, again, their responses to see, you know, those top three, what is most important to our stakeholders. Um, and they believe that taxes generated by visitors support the development of amenities that make Thurston County a great place to live. They believe that tourism helps um, local small businesses. Um, they believe that taxes generated by visitors support important community services. Um, and since there was a tie for number one, I'll give you one more, which was tourism supports jobs that people in this community need. Um, 
then we went into very specific aspects of our community and asked again each of these segments to rate them. Uh, so this slide pertains to our accommodations or lodgings. And you can see at a glance again that our locals um, felt, I'm trying to move this a little bit, felt um, that the experience of our accommodations was not nearly as good as what our visitors did. Um, our stakeholders tended to, with the exception of the issue of um, quantity of lodging establishments and um, the and conference services, our stakeholders tended to rank um, higher than our local residents. Um, also in quality of lodgings, our stakeholders ranked it less than our local residents. But across the board, our visitors are much happier with our destination experience than our locals. And we were very surprised. Um, we're really happy that that was the case. And again, if we're going to look at and that's a student in school and kind of identifying what is success. I want to be an A student. Um, and in, when I was in college a million years ago, that meant you needed to have a minimum of 90%. So right now we're at a solid B average with our visitors. Um, and I want that to be an A. But I also want to look at our residents and stakeholders and figure out how do we move the needle here? And I think it's going to take conversations and partnership with our municipalities, um, as well as organizations like economic development organizations or chambers or you know downtown alliances. We asked the same question about our restaurants and bars. Um, and again, our visitors very pleased um, across the boards. We actually got some A's here. People like our our customer service in our restaurants and bars. They think they're clean. They think they have good service. Um, they like the quality of the menu items, um, hours of operation. Uh, across the board, our visitors are very pleased. Uh, we have some areas with our local residents and stakeholders where they're not so pleased. Um, so in terms of hours of operation, they'd like to see more variety and they'd like to see more consistency of operation. Um, we were a little surprised by this. Um, this was the slide that pertained to arts and culture venues, and this was not um, the best news. <laughs> um, this was an area where we actually had visitors score lower than our locals and or uh, stakeholders. Um, and the areas where we scored lower was on friendly professional staff. Um, we were lower than... Um, we tied with our residents in terms of the variety and uniqueness. Um, we scored lower in the quality of performances and shows. Uh, we scored lower in hours of operation. Um, and the rest uh, were either very close or stakeholders um, scored higher than, than residents. But I can see there is an issue in this regard with uh, the visitors that responded to the survey. And to to be honest, the scores are just too low. Um, again, if a 90% is an A and our visitors are giving us scores in the 60s and 70s, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what that means. And so we need to dig a little deeper and we have to work in more partnership with the folks in our community that are under kind of this purview. Attractions and experiences. Um, Again, we trended these types of businesses or organizations um, trended much higher or at least tied with our stakeholder sentiment and certainly well above um, our residents. It was interesting, um, you know, the differential was pretty wild um, when it looked, when we looked at the quality of options, what our visitors felt versus what the people who live and work here felt, um, the variety, the number, um, and certainly hours of operation, there was some pretty big differences of opinion among visitors and locals. Uh, when it came to retail, um, visitors scored us um, pretty high um, in, in terms of customer service for timeliness. We got an A, um, not quite in terms of customer service with friendliness and professionalism, but it was still a pretty high score. Um, we're looking at a high solid B pretty much across the board with visitors. But again, our locals are not feeling it to the degree that our visitors are. Um, in natural attractions and parks, 
Um, again, pretty consistently, you know, what I would call B scores with visitors. Um, I was surprised that um, that our stakeholders had, um, or excuse me, that our residents scored, you know, some of these things as low as they did. Uh, so again, more reason why we need to be having open two-way communications with our locals. Transportation services. Um, across the board, I think these scores were just pretty low. Um, our, our visitors did tend to score higher than our residents, but not by a lot. And our stakeholders definitely had more negative sentiment about transportation services than um, either our locals or our visitors. When we look at event venues and services, our um, our visitors were pretty, you know, they were more than residents, but not by a huge margin. And we definitely, uh, I think our stakeholders have a lot more positive sentiment about the customer service side than both our locals and our, our visitors. So conversations needing to happen around event spaces and services. Um, when it came to conference venues, you know, when you're in the tourism industry and you don't have a convention center, uh, you just make this assumption that, well, of course, all of your visitors are going to, you know, say, where is your convention center? And your locals would say, where is your convention center? Um, um, it, I didn't see the huge rally call um, through this feedback. Um, so, you know, we did not score really high here uh, because we do not have a convention center and we have very limited conference venues and services are, you know, we are a destination for small and medium meetings. And so we have limited capacity here. So I'm not shocked that the scores are fairly low, um, but I, I think I would have thought that there would be more of a rally cry, more of a rally cry for more. Um, sports venues, uh, our stakeholders clearly really have really, you know, have higher opinion of our sports venues and services. Um, I was a little surprised and not the best way um, by our visitor feedback in this in this section. Um, and if you look at the scores, the percentages across the board, something um, I'm not sure what this means but it's it's not this is not a scoring um so something is going on in terms of our resident and visitors experience in these venue types that we need to kind of be working together on to figure out what the issue is um we asked each category just for some open ended feedback you know what would you like to see um in our community so our residents, I'll just give you the top three. Um, they would love to see a mid-range hotel of moderate size near the port. Um, they want better access to water and recreation options around Olympia, and they want a bigger range of nighttime family-friendly attra attractions. Um, and our residents kind of further down did say, you know, transportation like bus service and also a convention center. Our stakeholders, number one, was the convention center and or conference space. Um, higher end hotels, larger meeting space, um, more LGBTQ social places, um, more organized guided excursions. And our visitors, they would really like to see, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to move this and it is not working. Oops. Um, I'm going to try and interpret behind my Zoom window here. Um, they want to see a large museum featuring Washington State artists. I don't know why I cannot get this. There we go. Um, they are interested in boat racing, horse racing events, and car racing events. Um, they would like to see cleaner facilities in our state parks for RVing. Uh, they'd like kayak rentals um, and equestrian facilities for those who do not have their own horses, but where they could do a trail ride with their kids. Um, we asked folks about um, disabilities, um, just so that we understand if we have enough access being made available for folks. Um, and we thought it was very interesting that over 20% of our visitors indicated that they do have a disability. 
of some type. So we need to make sure both in our messaging and the images that we show, and as we're communicating with our municipal partners and our other community partners that we are being accessible to all. DEI is a huge part of how our program is operating and we wanna make sure that we are being inclusive for everybody trying to come to this area. Um, our business and marketing plan is completed now, integrating all of the data that we obtained through sentiment. We also integrated data that we um, kind of procured through location services, meaning um, we are able to leverage data from people's phones um, when they're in the market so we can kind of see where people are coming from. Uh, what does that cross visitation look like when they come to the area? Um, we look at consumer trend information, the latest industry stats and forecasts, and then we've integrated that all um, by vertical through our marketing plan. Historically, we've had one plan that kind of addressed everything in one fell swoop. Now it is all very sorted by individual vertical. And I'll show you at the end of this here in just a minute how you guys can access that. Um, we are uh, at the backbone of this program this year, going to be really looking to our locals. Um, as you saw with, uh, with sentiment being kind of what it is locally and knowing that our top driver of visitation is people coming to see their family and friends, we need to leverage our locals as our key influencers. You know, historically, we've been bringing in influencers from out of the area to put things on social media and you know tell people uh, outside the area about all the great things that we have to see and do. We're still going to do that, but we're going to do that locally as well, uh, because we know that the people who live and work here matter um, and what they have to say really impacts that experience. We're going to roll out a couple new campaigns. One um, is called Made in Thurston County. It is certainly to identify locally made products, services, stories in the area um, so that when a visitor comes to the area, we want them to buy something made here to take home or we want them to order something that is made here to take home rather than going to Walmart and seeing if there's a made in Washington section. Um, it's also a source of community pride. We want to acknowledge the people that are contributing in this area um, in a way that showcases what is being grown and what our history is in this area. Um, we're gonna be uh, uh, launching, we act, we've actually already launched a program called You Belong Here. We just wanna make sure that people, whether you're somebody who lives here, you work here, or that you're planning to visit, that you have a spot here. Um, this, uh, this area is welcoming, this area is friendly out of the words, uh, out of, the words of our visitors. And so we're gonna really be capitalizing on that. Um, we have developed a systematic approach for all of our lodging tax award recipients, um, regardless of what municipality um, your funding is coming from. If you are in any of the cities that are issuing lodging tax awards or the county, um, we are, have put together a suite of services that we are providing at no charge to each one of those award recipients, including a listing on our website. We're no longer charging membership dues, so there is no cost to them. Um, their event listing or listings, plural, um, on our website at no charge. We're going to do social media for every um, on for each recipient. We'll have um, each of those recipients will be included in our seasonal PR pitch sheets through Green Rubino, our public relations agency uh, that goes out to local and national media. Um, they'll be included in our partner email newsletter. They'll be included in our visitor email newsletters. We're also gonna be holding a couple of public meetings coming up, one in um, March at the end on the 30th and one at the end of April. We're calling them community listening sessions. We want to share probably not nearly that many slides um, with our stakeholders, but some key findings. And we wanna get a sense for what, what the real destination issues are that our stakeholders find and figure out, do we have alignment? Um, are the issues that your community is facing in Tumwater specifically, is it something that touches tourism? And if so, is there a way that we can partner in enhancing and improving that destination experience, whether it's for locals or for our visitors? 
Um, and then we'll form a plan to start carrying on that body of work in, in uh, 2024. So that is my presentation there. I would like to just show you very quickly, if you want to access the business plan, are you, are you able to see the website that I just called up? No. No, it's still, okay, let me stop that share. <laughs> And I will do another share, just a moment. And I think Councilmember Schneider had a question also. Okay, fantastic. Let me just show you this real quick, then I'll grab your, I'll answer your question. If you go to experienceolympia.com, you can just search for reports. And this page is gonna come up. We produce a monthly scorecard that will tell you our occupancy, both for hotels and motels, short-term rentals. It'll tell you all of our marketing stats, any KPIs that we have, um, our corridor management plan for the Thurston Bountiful Byway is on here. Last year's annual report is on here, and you can download our business and marketing plan. It's like 50 pages, so you don't want me to go through it today, um, and our three-year strategic plan. So full transparency, we want you guys to be partners in the work that we're doing, so I just wanted to share that with you. Okay. okay. Somebody okay. had a question. Thank you. Yeah, I do, Annette. So first, I, I want to thank you and your staff for getting a word out about the region and, for, um, of course, for tonight's presentation. Mm -hmm. So my concern is when you made the original presentation, the first slide and actually the last slide, you showed a logo of experiencing Tumwater and beyond. And then you showed one as well as Olympia, experiencing Olympia and beyond. Actually, mm -hmm. that was the only two times you showed those two logos together. So when I look at this publication, and if I was an outsider just coming in and wanting to know what was in the region, it would, what I would see that would pop out in the publication is the front cover, which says Experience Olympia and Beyond. So to me, it, it doesn't mention Tumwater. And I know through most of your publication, you talked about uh, uh, Olympia and Beyond, and then you jump to Thurston County and what they offered. So, I, I don't know why you just chose experience Olympia beyond and maybe not consider uh, Thurston County and beyond because it would be more accurate that's displaying who we are. If I was looking, say, on a site and saying, well, what can I do in this in this area, then Thurston County, experiencing Thurston County and beyond might have been a better description and might might have caught my eye more. Well, so first of all. Our brand, the name of our organization is Experience Olympia and Beyond, and that was created before I came here. <laughs> um, that, that was a decision that was made back in, I believe, 2016 or 2015. Um, and I know that there was a lot of heartburn about that. The brand used to be the Olympia Lacey Tumwater Visitor and Convention Bureau. And so you can imagine as a tourism organization, aside from just trying to answer the phone that way, somebody who's sitting in New York, that's not going to resonate with them. So I think that was why they kind of took the approach of putting their flag in the hill that had more brand recognition, whether we agree with it or not, that is, I believe, kind of the rationale for why that, that branding move was made. Um, when I came into this role, not quite, Quite two years ago, I did um, approximately 50 meetings in like four weeks with community stakeholders. And I heard a lot of what you're, the point that you're making and saying, hey, what about the name of my town? You know, um, it's, we don't want to just be the beyond, we want to be experienced Tumwater and beyond, not just, you know, the beyond and experience Olympia. And I heard that across the board from not just Tumwater. And so that was why we made the decision last year. We made a few decisions. One was to create at no charge all of the co-brands so that there is experience Tumwater, experience Lacey, experience every community in the Thurston County region. Um, we created a style guide. We made the logos. We made those accessible to all of our municipal partners and chambers of commerce to use in conjunction with us as well if they would like to. Um, we also took a look at that visitor guide and, and we can't have a visitor guide cover that has like every single logo because it just, first of all, that, that we have one brand and it is Experience Olympia and Beyond. However, the amount of information that was included in the visitor guide went from, it was like, it was very small. 
um, I think it was a page of the visitor guide, and we moved that to an entire section. So it's several pages. I think it's like, I could grab it and take a look. It might be like a dozen pages. We really grew the guide to make sure that we could provide far more information to speak to your point. We also understood that it wasn't just enough to only do the visitor guide and the co-branding. So we created an altogether additional freestanding community guide for each one of the communities within Thurston County. So there is an experience Tumwater community guide that we printed and made available um, at no charge. We also made those available on our website digitally. So we're taking every possible step that we can right now to be as inclusive as we can be, um, you know, with the limitations that we have. I, I hear the point that you're making, but without going through a comprehensive rebrand, this is kind of, these are the steps that we've been able to take. And, and I appreciate that. It, it just, just for me, if I was a visitor and I'm, I'm seeing what's going on and it doesn't draw me to your publication, Tumwater. And I, I think in the translation, we kind of get lost in that. And I, I mentioned mm -hmm. that on several of these presentations I attended. So I appreciate your explanation and your concerns about that. Thank you. And it, I mean, to be honest, it's challenging, you know, when you look at tourism, most tourism organizations are a county or a collection of municipalities. And it's, it's tough because you, it, it's a tough nut to crack um, because most visitors, when you're making a plan to go somewhere, you're thinking about like, aside from, a, oh, my, I'm going to go see mom and dad or friends or family. You're thinking about the things that you like to do. And so we know when people are choosing their, making their planning decisions, we need to do things that are relating to the things that they like to do. It's almost more important that we have, like right now we have a really exciting video that's coming out called It's the Water. And it's all about uh, Tom Water's brewing history and the impact that it has today. It's literally coming out in a matter of days. Um, so, you know, projects like that, where we can show people the amazing things that they can latch onto that speak to their interests, it's almost more important than the logo. Because, I mean, when is the last time you took a vacation, you came home and you went, oh my gosh, did you see that logo? That was amazing. You're like, no, you talk about that incredible experience that you had in the destination. And so we're just really... You know, I'm, I'm so sensitive to, you know, the topic that you bring up because I, I think it's valid and it's worth the conversation, but we have to, until we figure out how to address that issue, we're just going to try to lean in really hard to making sure that we say, what are those things in Tumwater that are so exciting and so impactful? And let's really um, lend our resources to those things. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Council Member uh, Dolha. Thanks, Mayor. Um, hi, Annette. So I had a question. Could you remind me who writes, like I'm looking where to eat and drink in Tom Water, like who writes those blurbs for each city and who gives input? Um, you know, we see, so we do have a content and brand manager on staff. Um, but for example, when we do our community guide, um, where we add everything about Tumwater, we send those to Ann. Um, and I think it may have gone to Austin, but I'm pretty sure it went to Ann. Um, and we send those to community stakeholders so that you guys can chime in. We don't okay. do that on every blog because we just literally couldn't. I mean, I'm just reading it and I was like, um, like if I went to Jean-Pierre 316, I would have no money, right? Like that's my whole paycheck is one evening, there, uh -huh. right? And so when I'm reading this, my initial thought is like, where's River's Edge? Because that's the place to go on Friday at eight o'clock or Spencer and everyone will know your name. And then where's Ramirez, right? Like that is like an institution in Tumwater for their tamales. Um, so that's why I was just wondering like who writes this and who's doing input? Because I think there's some when I read it, it's really heavy alcohol and Tom water is more than alcohol. Sure. And it's just yeah. a visceral re reaction to me is it's, we are more than that. So what does it look like to have that and 
not dissuade people who maybe are choosing not to drink or it just yeah. that's right that's not their environment right now well i will say right now we only have five people on staff <laughs> so we well, you're doing we do an amazing one... job in that with thank five you people <laughs> thank you so we have one person who's doing all of the writing for everything that we do um and so she you know she is doing the best that she can to be as you know, inclusive and accepting of feedback, but we just have to have people let us know. So we don't know if something isn't meeting your standard if you if you don't tell us. So, I mean, I know we're open to guest blogging. We are open to feedback from any of our community partners because we want to get it right. But there isn't a limit that says, ah, you know, we're only going to, you know, print what we think. But our ability to get to every location is is tough so we right. do want we do value your input and we do want to get that from you well i think your website is super sharp it's really been updated nicely and i did want to hear i know angela is representing tom water on your board but i know eileen has been a long time member and i just want to know like hear from eileen if she had any thoughts about all this maybe angela Who wants to go first? Yeah, um, you go, go ahead, Angela. <laughs> um, yes, I believe that we have an X. We have, um, they have a website where we can go into and populate that data. Um, and also website graphics, and that has been working really, really hard um, with her, her limited budget. So, I have to say thanks for that, but I think we can populate that data of some of that stuff that you were talking about. Is that correct, um, Annette? Well, you, so people who have listings, mm -hmm. so we have a thing called the partner portal. So if you're a business or an organization, you can update your listing anytime at no charge. Now, a blog is a little different. Um, you wouldn't be able to go in and just update a blog. But what you can do is you can email me or Heidi on my staff and say, hey, I would really love to see the focus of, you know, food shift. You know, I'd like to see you represent us more in this way. And, and that's really kind of the point of my doing this presentation when I talk about community alignment. I have to make sure you guys understand that you are, you're a trusted resource for us. And I, we have to have each of you kind of be our boots in the ground because you're, you're there, um, you know, we're, we're in our chairs <laughs> trying to do, to do this work. And you guys, you know a lot and you have a lot more experience than probably all of us, but we can't, if we don't have the relationship, you're not gonna know that it's okay for you to just literally text me, my cell number is in my email signature and say, Annette, you're talking about cheeseburgers, but we really wanna talk about pizza, help, um, and yeah. we can fix it because we want that directive feedback. Uh, we got pretty thick skins over here. Um, so we want to know. Gotcha. Um, you're user friendly. So we'll be sending you those emails. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I just want to thank Annette because um, I have been on the, uh, the BCB uh, before Annette came on and just, um, you know, the bringing it back from COVID and everything that you've um, had to go in and, and you're, you're building. <laughs> Um, I just, I really appreciate um, your enthusiasm and everything that you're doing. It's just, um, it, you know, just a hundred percent change on, on what we've, um, I think in the past. And I love the fact that you updated the website. Um, I, I was thinking about the stats, so about the people that live here, it's maybe because we live here, you know, and we just, you know, we're like, meh, you know, we know, um, yeah. You know, we are asked our opinion on that. It's kind of like, yeah, so, but other people coming here with fresh eyes have a different perspective and they're here to vacation or here to have fun. So they would see it from a, a different perspective. Um, and I'm curious if we have any uh, things out there because well, the big thing now is like food tours or um, if that's something that has been cobbled together yet, the idea of um, having those kinds of services or people that want to do uh, brewery tours or food tours just on the, because we have so many really great restaurants around mm -hmm. this area that might be kind of a fun addition to, to the, like the website or someone mm -hmm. doing. So. 
You know, one of the cool things about the, the new website is we have an itinerary building slash mapping tool that we didn't used to have. So we can very easily create self-guided tours that centralize around interests, even if we don't have small businesses that have been created to offer guided tours. Um, so one of the things that we're hoping to accomplish this year is to A, um, understanding what our affinity categories are based, from, based on our website analytics and what we're seeing with actual traveler movement um, to create these itineraries and or tours where um, we can also integrate our certified tourism ambassador program um, and have these folks that have gone through this kind of front end tourism training kind of serve as those boots on the ground. Um, you know, Eileen, when I wanna kind of speak to one of the things that you said too about, you know, that resident sentiment versus out of area. It's, it's, it is important because when, when you're coming to an area what you remember is the experience that you have with the people. You know, what are the people like? And, um, you know, I was so happy when folks describe us as being friendly, you know, in our, in our visitors. And I think that's really important because it's, it is easy to have that forest for the trees situation. You're like, yeah, we live here. Yeah, we got some oysters, you know, like big deal. It, like as somebody who moved here from Eastern Washington, those oysters and our beer isn't like, what? Like I can't even... It's, it's amazing, like I'm not gonna get tired of it. Um, and when our visitors come here, something that I think people forget about, you know, the, the difference of the impact between residential local spend and visitor spend is that these folks come into the area, they leave their money with us and then they go home. And that's new money. Um, so the more new money we have, the better. And so seeing that positive sentiment, that's really good. I mean, it's like an insurance policy, you know, if, if things go a little sideways locally, if you've got a really healthy diversified tourism mix, it's very good, you know, insurance for our economic health as a destination. Yeah. It'll be interesting, like you mentioned the with the legislative session, it'll be interesting to see the report card you know, another month or so, you know, based on you know yeah. the impact you know, with the uh, people coming into town again. So yeah, we look forward to those yeah. steps. And yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I wish that we could measure a little better, because I'm all about measuring everything. Um, like anything that can be measured, we are measuring it, we are tracking it, we are adjusting it. Um, but one thing that we haven't kind of cracked the nut on, I mean, we can, we can measure visitation to retail and restaurants through our location services to a certain degree, you know, through geof geofencing. Um, but, but not as tightly as I'd like, because I think that's where we're going to see huge impact is that multiplier effect of session. A lot of people looking for meeting spaces, a lot of people looking for places to go and have lunch, um, to do, you know, have some, uh, local experiences. And so, I mean, we can easily measure lodging, whether it's in hotels and motels or short-term rentals. I can measure uh, POI cross visitation, you know, if they're at the Capitol and they're also going to, you know, are they at this meeting space? Are there, are they also showing up in lodging properties? You know, we can, we can look at it that way, but we know that that's only a representative sample because they have to meet certain criteria to show up in that, um, to show up in those reports. So um, it, it's going to be interesting and we will be reporting on it and it will all be full transparency on the report section of our website. Great. Any other questions or comments? So thanks so much, Annette. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, and I think this is very informative and, and it has changed a lot from uh, when I think we had a presentation, I'm trying to even think, probably four years ago or so, uh, that was in depth like this. And I think it was right after the name changed and stuff. So this okay. is this is a very great update. Well, I just, I want to thank you for letting me be here. And I don't want it to be four years uh, before we do this again. And I hope that if, if there is something that you would like me to take away that you feel welcome sharing that, you know, if you have a suggestion, if you have feedback, if you have a question, um, I can pass along anything to my board. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so we'll go to Mayor City Administrator Report. Uh, John, do you have anything? Um, you know, just maybe while Annette is still here, I just want to do a quick shout out. Um, remind everyone, Councilmember Jefferson is on the board of um, of the VCB of uh, Experience Olympia and beyond, as is Chuck Denny, our Parks and Recreation Director. And Chuck has been very involved um, and recognized at a statewide level for um, his work with events. So um, appreciate both of them um, helping helping that organization. Um, I understood that uh, Councilmember Kathy wanted to talk about, um, again, sort of revisit the um, consent agenda issues, but I think in light of what time it is, and we've had some really great robust discussion, uh, we probably can circle back on that issue of the consent agenda at another meeting. So um, I would suggest I don't have anything else to add tonight. Right, and you're okay with that, Councilmember Kathy? Okay, perfect. And I don't think I have anything to add to that. So uh, we've had a very informative meeting, a little long, but it's been very informative. So uh, with that, I will adjourn our work session and everyone have a great evening. Thank you.